Let's give God glory. Let's bless his wonderful name on tonight. Would you lift up that hand for just one moment? Let's bless him together. I want us to uh, saturate the atmosphere. Uh, would you just bless him with the sound of your worship, the sound of your praise? Come on, would you magnify him? I would dare think that you've got a greater praise than that. You have a greater sound than that. Hallelujah. Now let's go from worship into intercession. Let God hear your voice tonight. Tell him what's on your mind. Tell him what's on your heart. Tell him what's going on in your body. Tell him what's going on in your marriage, what's going on with your child. Tell him about where you are in your walk. What's causing you frustration? What's giving you consternation? What's giving you pause? Hallelujah. Now begin to thank him for answered prayer tonight. Come on, I said thank him. Come on, thank him with authority. Thank him with confidence. Thank him with certainty. Thank him with assurance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am uh, so grateful while you're yet standing. Would you uh, secure uh, your copy of the Word of God? Open up your Bible apps wherever you might find yourself. Uh, we have uh, been uh, over the last two weeks on driving on E uh, because uh, we're believing that uh, we are going to be uh, equipped, uh, empowered, and uh, engaged. Uh, it is, I hope it is our intention uh, that through this series you will never be the same another day in your life. Uh, that how it is that you see yourself and where you see yourself uh, in the body of Christ called church is evolving and it is developing. Uh, it is growing. I don't want you to be stagnant believers. I, I want you to be believers who are stretched to be in the position uh, that God uh, envisions uh, for your life. Uh, where you are right now is not the final stop. Uh, it's just a layover for where it is that God is taking you. How, how many of you were uh, blessed on Sunday? You were blessed on Sunday. Uh, what, what an amazing outpouring uh, of the Holy Spirit. I'm believing that uh, that same oil uh, is still flowing amongst us uh, on uh, this night and uh, all the more I'm on tiptoe anticipation uh, for how God is going to uh, meet us on Sunday. I want you to bring all of your friends, all of your family, uh, all of uh, your neighbors, uh, all the people uh, who you pass in your day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of life I want you to invite them to be a part of uh, what God has uh, equipped us to do uh, on this Sunday, not just for the worship experience, uh, but tell them you want them to see a modern-day miracle uh, that in one day, above tithes and offerings, we're going to collectively uh, raise $250,000 uh, for the refurbishment of uh, what needs to take place. Uh, that, that was a terrible clap. That clap almost drove me into depression. Thank you. Amen. Amen. That, that means you've got to be a part of it, that you've got to be involved in it, and you have to be a partner, uh, whether you're going to uh, come into covenant with 5,000 or 1,000 or 500 or, or 100, but I am uh, buying for 100% participation. I want all of us to be able to do it. Uh, by ourselves, we can't, but together we can. Uh, we are uh, moving uh, uh, towards, it's hard for me to believe, uh, that new birth is about to turn 40 years old. Isn't that amazing? Uh, full grown, full grown. Uh, ye yesterday, I was in uh, Baltimore uh, for the 24th anniversary of Empowerment Temple. And uh, to, to, to leave uh, thinking we had done something at 24. Uh, but to see what God did in 40 uh, really just it ignites my faith all the more. Uh, make sure that uh, you have shifted your schedule and your calendar uh, for May 4th. On May 4th will be the groundbreaking for our many homes, and I want everybody here. I'm telling you, only God could have done this. 
uh, in uh, just uh, 15 months' time, uh, for him to do that quick and speedy turnaround uh, is nothing short of miraculous. Uh, would you join me in the second book of the Bible? Uh, we're going back to the book of uh, Exodus. We're going back to the book of Exodus. Uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Last week we were dealing uh, with the uh, principle of being equipped. Uh, this week we're dealing with what it means to be empowered and what is uh, the responsibility of the church in so doing. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. If you can give me a little bit more on the monitor to help me live to fight another day. Thank you. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? Uh, the Lord, and say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? A staff, he replied. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? And the Lord, that the Lord did not appear to you. What if they say the Lord never came to you? Watch God's response to that question. The Lord said, uh, what is in your hand in response to what do I do about what people say? The Lord said, what's in your hand? And Moses responded, a staff. You may be seated. Uh, for those of you who are taking uh, notes on tonight, those of you who are online, uh, I want you to partner with me in our virtual community. Uh, I want to uh, teach tonight using as a subject, you got what it takes. You got what it takes. Uh, would you look at the person beside you? They need to hear it. Would you look at them and tell them you got what it takes? You got what it takes. Amen. I, I, I want you to resoundingly say that to yourself. I've got what it takes. Theodore Roosevelt said it first, uh, but Arthur Ashe said it best. Uh, and I want you to uh, uh, hear this quote from uh, Arthur Ashe. Uh, Arthur Ashe said, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. I want every person in the room, would you repeat after me? Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. I was trying to figure out how y'all remembered it that quick. I didn't realize it was behind me. <laughs> The Lord, y'all are a smart class. All right, uh, let, let, let's start it over again. Uh, come on, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. I want you to speak that over the life of the person who's next to you. Come on, say it with authority. Start where you are. Use what you have and do what you can. Amen. So it doesn't matter what station of life you're in, whether you are a retiree, whether you are on disability, whether you're in your second year of college, whether you have finished a tour of duty in the military, whether you are a returning citizen from the criminal justice system, how the reality is all you've got to do is start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. Uh, who is this man, uh, Pastor, that you're talking about, Arthur Ashe? Uh, Arthur Ashe was a uh, Wimbledon champion. Here it is, who was uh, contracted HIV, uh, not from a sexual irresponsibility, uh, but from a poor blood transfusion as given by the Red Cross. Uh, he is, watch this, a champion and afflicted. He is a winner with a wound. And he took on as his mantra, it doesn't matter what's happening to me, here it is, even if I'm not the one responsible. Even if I'm in this position, it is not because of bad decisions or poor choices, and it's not because of sin. I am in this position, but I refuse to surrender as a weakling or as a victim. All I can do is start where I am, use what I have, and do the best that I can. I want that to be so uh, gnawing in your subconscious uh, that you say it to yourself even in your sleep. I want that to be a part of yourself, that it is uh, what David calls, I encourage myself, uh, that I'm going to start where I am, I'm going to use what I have, and I'm going to do what I can. Uh, there are some scriptures that I want to uh, tag 
uh, on to Arthur Ashe's statement, and we're going to go through uh, three of them, I think, on tonight. Uh, the first one, if you'll help me, uh, media ministry, uh, you were so kind to me. Go to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, and uh, we're going to uh, uh, look at verses 1 through 3. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. The wife of a man came from the company of the prophets, cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditors are coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. The prophet Elisha is uh, walking uh, through this uh, community. While he's walking through with all of his uh, priestly garments on, a woman raises up her window, yells out of the window, Hey, man of God, you know me. My husband was on your staff. My husband died. It says, watch this, that uh, he died and uh, her boss, his boss wasn't even at the funeral. It further goes on to say that since the death, he ain't checked on her. Uh, Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Uh, but yet she's still believing in God when the people at the church didn't handle her right. I, 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 no, I, I need y'all to look at what this text is saying. She says, I'm, I'm in a bad place. I'm in a bad place. The creditors are coming after me because my husband was a man of God with poor financial management skills. He's a man of God, but had no life insurance. He's a man of God, had no policy. Had a man, he's a man of God, uh, but he didn't do according to what it is that Proverbs prescribes, is that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children, and yet the man of God didn't do it. He says, watch this, he feared God, hear this, but never respected death. Yeah, he loves God, but he didn't do the things that were appropriate for him to do to be a provider for his family. And then I want you to hear what Elijah says. Elijah says, what can I do for you? What do you mean? I just told you the creditors are coming. I just told you they're coming to collect my boys. I just told you that we between a rock and a hard place. I just told you my husband died. I'm telling you sometimes when you're in crisis, church people will be casual. When it is that you're going through, people will act oblivious. Your need is obvious, but they act like they willfully are going to ignore it. What do you mean, what can you do for me? And he says, all right, I'll tell you what. What do you have in your house? Not any bitcoins. Not any bars of gold. Hear this. Isn't it amazing when he asks a housewife what she has, that she never says sheets and towels, china and flatware, he asked, what do you have in your house? And she said, all I got is oil. Yeah. For those of you who are taking notes, I need you to write that down. All I got is oil. Now you got to speak, think of who it is that she's talking to. She's talking to a man of God who is not just a preacher proclaimer, but is a prophet. All right? A prophet operating in the prophetic is standing in the now, seeing into the next. What do you have? And her response is, all I have is a vial of oil. I want you to just write down that vial of oil. I'm going to come back to it in just one moment. Now I need you to run over to Matthew chapter 14. Go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 15 through 19. Matthew chapter 14, verse 15 through 19. As evening approached, the disciples came in and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy something by themselves, some food. Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Look at verse number 17. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. 
uh, they are under uh, the Palestinian sun. And so on any given day, it's uh, orbiting, hovering uh, in temperature between 97 and 110 degrees. 97 and 110 degrees, part and parcel of why it is that Jesus often taught by the water because that's the only way they could get wind. The only way that people are not going to fall out from dehydration. It's a whole nother sermon, how you in the desert, give me fish and bread, but don't give me nothing to drink. That's a, that's a, that's a whole nother sermon, whole nother story right there. Uh, and watch what the disciples say. The disciples say, Master, uh, it's too many of them. It's too many of them. It's 5,000. Hear this, 5,000. And that 5,000, ladies and gentlemen, is just the men. They weren't even counting how many women and children were there. And watch what the people of faith say. The people of faith say, send the people with need away. Yeah, that, that, that's what the church people say. <laughs> and send them away. Another disciple in uh, uh, another rendition of the Synoptic Gospels uh, calculates it and said, Jesus, in order for us to feed all these people, it's going to take a year worth of 12 working men's wages to pay for this. I already got the budget in my head. Because a lot of people, watch this, who are working in ministry immediately go to budget before they think of breakthrough. And they allow budget to be the limit for what the breakthrough can be. Yeah, you got to ask yourself, what kind of ministry would you have if budget wasn't an issue? You got to ask yourself, what kind of church is it that they only do ministry that matches budget? Yeah, you, you got to be careful. What is your level of faith if you're functioning as a church on what you can afford to do? Now, if it's what you can afford to do, what do you need faith for? Uh, so they said, send them away. That's what they said. Send them away. Now, in the passage that we've read for you today in Matthew chapter 15, you'll notice that there's a slight nuance uh, from the other passages by which you have read it uh, in Mark is that in uh, Matthew, they don't give any credit to the little boy. They say, Jesus said, what do you have? And they said, we got two fish and five loaves of bread like it came from them. Yeah, yeah I'm telling you, when you are a giver, you got to be at a place. I don't mind if my name ain't called. Yeah. When, when, when I'm a giver, I'm, I'm at a place, here it is, where I don't have to be recognized. Now, it's 5,000, watch this, men. But there are 12 men on the staff. So you got 5,012 men with no resource. When the men, watch this, make up the earning potential of the community. So what does it say if I got 5,012 men, but a miner has got to produce the resource? Oh my God. God is saying, when I'm getting ready to produce something, it's going to come from a way you never thought. It's going to come from the hands that you never expected. It's going to come from people who you never knew had that much on them. But God is getting ready to do it in spite of where you thought it was going to come from. The Bible says be careful how you treat people. Because you may be entertaining angels unaware. I, I would have thought. I would have thought. I would have thought, since this miracle is repeated in all of the Gospels, I would have thought one of them would have called the little boy's name. All four Gospels omit that little boy's name as if he is of no consequence when he saved the day. Ah, ah, but maybe, just maybe, the little boy was unlike most of us. When he saw the miracle going forth, he said, don't call my name. Because I didn't do this. God is the one that made this happen. And I am glad to be a partner and a participant in a meal. Can I say something to somebody? Whenever it is that you sow into God's house, know that you are the little boy in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You are helping to perpetuate a miracle. And even if your name is never called, make sure that you give God's name the glory. Now, uh, in uh, the first instance, I told you to write down oil. Yeah. 
This time, what I want you to write down is bread. I want you to write down bread. First time you wrote down oil. Second time you wrote down bread. Now, let's go to our third scripture, and uh, I'm going to try to tie it together before we get to the fourth one. 1 Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17, 48 through 51. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it, and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face forward on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and the stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. And uh, after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran. Uh, so all of you know the story of uh, David and Goliath. Uh, but there are some uh, snapshots uh, that I need to enlarge uh, for you to see on today. Uh, what I need you to see is that they are in uh, the valley. And uh, uh, while they're in this uh, valley, uh, there is a giant by the name of Goliath, you already know, who is taunting the children of God, uh, saying to them that their God is not real. Uh, David is not in the military. He's just there on assignment. Uh, dropping off some sandwiches on behalf of his dad, and he overhears Goliath, hear this, making fun of his brothers. Goliath, this is going to mess you up. Goliath, nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture did Goliath ever speak to David. Nowhere, ever. So this is not David's fight. He gets in the fight, here it is, because his brothers didn't have the heart to do it. Part of the responsibility of being in the body of Christ is sometimes you got to take on other people's fight. You got to take on other people's issues. You got to take on other people's circumstance, even when it will not directly impact your well-being. That is your call of ministry. He goes down and he volunteers and watch what the king does. The king puts his armor on David. He puts the armor on David and David says, take this off of me. It does not fit. God, help me. Do you know how many people leave the church because we try to put an unusual uniform on them? Uh, that we try to make them fit into what we think a Christian is supposed to dress like and what they're supposed to look like. And he said, listen, I'm going to fight this battle, but I got to be myself in doing it. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me because the people who are in the standard registered uniform, they're dressed up, but they ain't got no fight in them. I would rather be out of uniform and serious about spiritual warfare than be out of place. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. We got a whole lot of people that want to sit up front and want title and want position. But when it's time to fight demons and when it's time to go into the devil's camp, then they don't know what to do, but they dressed up. He said, take this off me. He said, take this off of me. I cannot fight with this. Then I need you to see what David does. David pulls out of his back pocket a sling. Here it is. It is his tool because David is a shepherd. And this is, watch this, uh, used to ward off uh, bears and lions. I got to just do it. Tigers, oh my. But ain't no tigers in no way in there. But uh, I'm just throwing in there because you know it. Uh, but watch this. He's got, uh, he's got the slingshot. Here's the problem. But he's got no stones. It is just as unconscionable as having a gun but having no bullets. He, he, he is half prepared. And that's the problem with a whole lot of believers. Here it is, that they only got one part of the weaponry. They got praise but got no prayer. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. You got to have both of those. Otherwise, all you got is a sling with no rock. But when you got a prayer life that can go with your praise, no weapon that is formed against you shall be able to prosper. 
He had no idea because David had never fought a giant before. He had never fought a giant before. He had just fought off bears before just fought off lions before, but had no idea that what he was doing in his previous job was training him for his present position. Uh, can I say it to you another way? Last night I was in Baltimore uh, preaching at Empowerment Temple. I said to them, thank you for training me for where I was supposed to go. I, I thought I was here to stay. But I did not know that in this position, God was equipping me for the next position. You don't know what you're supposed to be getting on where you are right now. It is not punishment. It is preparation because there's something bigger you're going to have to deal with. So he goes in. He gets uh, five smooth stones. And you already know the story. I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, you already know the story uh, that he winds it up. Come on, Gap Band. He winds it up. And uh, when he <laughs> winds it up uh, with one smooth stone, he uh, hits uh, Goliath uh, between the eyes. Can you imagine if God only gives you one shot? What are you going to do with it? You only got one opportunity to do it right. Yeah. If, um, if the stone would have hit his chest, it would have bounced off of Goliath's shield. He had to hit him be between the eyes because he wasn't tall enough to fight him. He wasn't strong enough to wrestle with him. He only got one shot. Sometimes when you are dealing with the things of the supernatural, you only got one time to get it right. Oh, y'all ain't understand what I'm saying to you. You, you got to maximize your moment uh, because I got to make sure the blow is so heavy that the enemy can't even entertain the notion of fighting me back. I, I got to hit him right between the eyes so that he knows I am not to be taken lightly even though I don't dress like them church people, even though I ain't got the training of them church people, don't play with me because I still got some fight in me and I will deal with you head on. God gave me a revelation. He gave me a revelation almost at midnight. I'm telling you, I, I almost jumped out of the balcony uh, of my hotel room in Baltimore last night. I promise you I did, uh, but I didn't want y'all to read about me in the AJC today. Uh, but I almost jumped out of the window uh, last night and it messed me up uh, because he wound up the slingshot, wound up the slingshot, and uh, he hit Goliath uh, between the eyes in his head. Watch this, and he dies. Lord, help me. Isn't it amazing, all your time in church and vacation Bible school, uh, isn't it amazing in Sunday school that that's where we end the story? Uh, then David runs over to him, picks up Goliath's sword, watch this, and then chops off his head. I, I had never, Kyle heard this in my whole life. Uh, it says, watch this, that David killed them twice. God, help me. He didn't just kill him once. He then came, and here's where y'all got to shout. He beheaded him with his own sword. God, what Goliath thought he was going to use on David, David used it on him. God, y'all better be careful. Whatever the enemy thought he was going to kill you with, use it on him. Whatever they hold over your head, tell your own testimony. Yes, I used to be drunk. Yes, I used to be high. Yes, I was in the street. But look at me now. Tell the devil twice. Huh? Yeah, kill the devil twice. I got to show you this. Be seated. I got to show you this. Uh, the first thing, first thing that you wrote down uh, first thing you wrote down was oil. Is that the first thing you wrote down? Second thing you wrote down, watch this, uh, was uh, bread. Third thing uh, that you wrote down uh, is sling. Yeah. So you got oil, you got bread, you got sling. All right. 
Uh, let's get to our text because my time is moving so quick. I don't even know what happened. Uh, <laughs> the Lord calls a, a uh, the Lord calls an unconvicted felon. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to jump off this stage. An unconvicted felon, here it is, who is guilty but never gets sentenced. Um, he knows he did it. God knows he did it. But he never does time for what he did. Oh, my God. I, I don't know how y'all ain't flipping these chairs over. When, when you realize how much like Moses we are, that I did some stuff that I should have been punished for. But God looked beyond my faults and, and still used me in spite of that. We talk about Moses being on the run for 40 years. Uh, but Carrie, what we never talk about is for 40 years how God never talked to him. That maybe his punishment wasn't the penitentiary. Maybe his punishment was silence. Oh my God. Only people with a prayer life. God, I can't. Only people with a prayer life know how agonizing it is not to hear the voice of God. You, you don't know what's happening with you. You, you looking for any sign or something, any word. For, is there any word from the Lord? Can you say anything? For 40 years, God says nothing to Moses till he catches him on a, a mountainside one day. And I need you to see uh, the topography of what's happening uh, on Mount Sinai is the Lord tells Moses to take off his shoes. That don't mean nothing to you till you realize that this mountain is known for scorpions. This, uh, this, this don't mean nothing to you until um, you realize that this mountain uh, is uh, peppered with uh, uh, charred glass and broken rocks. Y'all never paid attention that I got no evidence anywhere biblically where God made anybody else take off shoes. He, he says, I need you to take your shoes off. Y'all ain't going to like it as a, uh, a foreshadow to what's going to happen to my other son. God, help me. I'm, I'm putting you in a place where your feet are going to be pierced. Hallelujah. You, you getting ready to feel pain for the places you should have never been. You, you getting ready to leave a blood trail for the areas you should have never walked in. But I, I need you to trust me with your shoes off. I, I, I need you to be vulnerable. And, and Moses has been condemned in his own conscience and says, why uh, would the people believe me? Because Moses thinks like many of us think that everybody knows our sin. He disqualified himself. Said, ain't no way they're going to believe this. I have a stammering tongue. I got to give this to you. I don't even know who this is for tonight. But isn't it crazy that Moses never stuttered until he got called? <sighs> Nowhere else does he stutter until there's a call of God on his life. Your weakness is amplified in your anointing. I went too deep, y'all. Did you hear what I just said? You, you, your anointing exposes the areas of you that are vulnerable. You, you didn't even realize how jacked up you were till God called you. You, you didn't even realize how much of a mess you were until he put his hand on your life. That's, that's why I'm scared of people who are anointed and arrogant. If, if you know what your issue is, how in the world do you think you better than us? And he said, what, what if they don't believe me? And the Lord said, um, what's in your hand? And Moses replies, a rod. In another translation, it says a staff. Contemporary English version says a stick. Yeah. And uh, uh, that staff, that stick, that rod is so important uh, because he's a shepherd. And so he uses the hook of it 
to Tiffany, here it is, to pull people in. Watch this, yes. He uses that staff to pull wayward sheep in, even though he's outside of grace. He's pulling them in. He uses the other side of the staff as a javelin. In the case that bears are coming, in case lions are coming, he throws it at them to stop them dead in their tracks. And he says, what is in your hand? Uh, In case you're just logging on tonight, I'm talking about you already have what it takes. Uh, For those of you who are in the room, let me show you that you already have what it takes. Uh, In the first instance, uh, what did I tell you you had? You had oil. I got to stop right here. This woman is a widow. She got two sons she's trying to raise by herself. She has been thrusted into single parenthood. A prophet comes by. Here it is, a prophet who is known for demonstrating the power of God, and he does nothing miraculous. All he says is, what do you have? And she said, I got oil. Are you there? It, It is only revealed when you have questions. It is only revealed when you have questions. Then I took you over to Matthew, and Jesus had been teaching that day until the sun started to go down. He has 5,000 people. One of the disciples said, Master, send them away. It's getting dark. We got nothing to feed them with. Here it is again. What do you have? He said, all we got is two fish and five loaves of bread. Uh, I, I, uh, I wonder if you're still here. I, I, I wish I could tell you about uh, uh, this guy by the name of Moses who got a stammering tongue. And he says to Jesus, he says to God, uh, rather, uh, what if they don't believe that you called me, that you sent me, that you've been with me? And here comes the same answer. What do you have? Says, I got a rod. This is getting ready to mess you up as much as it messed me up. Uh, the bread, the oil, watch this, uh, the rod. The sling, that's where I messed up. And the sling, it's four of them. Here it is. Uh, The bread, uh, the oil, the sling, and the rod. That's four of them. Give them to me again. Yeah. 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 The oil, the bread, the sling, and the rod. Here's, Here's what I need you to see in all of them. None of them are miraculous. God never made the oil appear. In this instance, he does not send manna down from heaven. Y'all stay with me. He never gave Moses a rod. Never gave David a slingshot. He said, for the miracle to happen, you already got it in your possession. You have been walking around with the equipment that I need to do the supernatural. But you didn't even know you already carrying it. If you would just start flowing in what you already got, you ain't got to look at what other people have because the glory is already on you. And I want to show you where it is because you already got it. I just want to show you where it is. You already got it. I just want to show you where it is. You already got it. I just want to show you where it is. And the prophet said to her, here it is. What do you have in your house? And she said, watch this, not at the church. It's at my house. My house got enough oil to change the finances of my family. Y'all don't know when to shout on a Tuesday night. I dare you to start giving God glory that God is going to give you a revelation in your house of what you can do to change your circumstance and the circumstance of your children. What you need is in your house. Uh, what's, uh, what's after the oil? Prayer. Prayer. Sun is going down. <laughs> Sun is going down. And he asked 12 grown men, who are surrounded by 5,000 grown men, what do you have? And they said, we got nothing. But there is a child amongst us. They got two fish and five loaves of bread. I hope y'all are prepared to give God real glory tonight. God says, you don't even know 
how I am getting ready to do something supernatural in your child's life. That what I do in them, I'm preaching to me, what I do for your children will be able to take care of you. You ain't gonna have to always take care of them, but I'm gonna shift some stuff on your behalf. You better give God glory because wealth is coming out of your child. Surplus is coming out of your child. Multiplication is coming out of your child. So I, I, I'm getting ready to bless what's in your house. I'm getting ready to bless what's in your children. Let's go to that slang. He says, watch this. Uh, how, what are you going to fight with if we're taking the armor off of you? And the Bible says in 2 Kings, uh, 2 Samuel, it says, watch this, and David had no sword. That's what it says. And David had no sword. So what is David fighting with? David is fighting with past experiences. What I had to do in my past is going to help me in my fight today. Some of y'all ain't even talking to you. If you ain't been through no hell in your past, you are not equipped for what's getting ready to happen. But if there's anybody that came out swinging and you made up in your mind, for God I live and for God I'll die. It says, I am going to use the trauma of your past, the scars of your past, the burden of your past, it was giving you the equipment you needed for your present. Last, he says to Moses, you are responsible for two million people. What are you going to do? And he said, what do you have in your hand? I am afraid that uh, the good part is now over. The shouting has come to an end. Uh, because what I am getting ready to say is in conflict with my thesis statement for tonight. I told you, you already have what you need. But I need you to see what God said once uh, Moses reveals what he has. He says, all I got is a rod. Watch what God says next. God then says, throw it down. Oh my God. He says, I need you to get rid of what you were used to holding on to. Because you think that's what's going to help you. But it's not by might, it's not by power, it's not only my spirit that's going to help you to do it. Sometimes you can't win until you can release what you like. As long as you hold on to it, you ain't ever going to get the victory. And some of y'all, you ain't going to get the victory because you still holding on to how we did church before. You still holding on to the old location. You still holding on to the old tradition. God said, release it. And when you release it, watch your enemy start running. All I needed you to do is throw it down. So throw it down. And you have to have spiritual maturity for what's getting ready to happen because he throws it down. I'm in Exodus. I'm in Exodus chapter 4. I need you to see what happens. This is so scary. It's so unnerving. Uh, it's dizzying, in fact, uh, that he throws it down and uh, the rod turns into a snake. That don't mean nothing to you. That don't mean nothing to you until you realize this is the first time we've seen a snake since the Garden of Eden. Oh, my God. So he says, watch this. I am entrusting you, uh, Moses, to beat the enemy your ancestors couldn't. Oh, my God. Says, you don't even understand. You get ready to destroy generational curses because they did not have the tenacity or the fortitude. But he said, when you grab it, grab it by the tail. Let them know, watch this, that I grabbed you at the most dangerous place. Because if you grab a snake by the tail, it can reel around and bite you. But he said, Moses, grab it by the tail so the snake knows this is the end of your reign. That you no longer have any authority over anything in my life. 
And I need somebody to know if you give God glory, this is the end. This is the end of your depression, the end of your unhappiness, the end of your uselessness. God said, grab it by the tail. It's the end of it. You have what it takes, even though you are ill-equipped, <laughs> even though you're ill-prepared, even though in the natural you should be disqualified. <laughs> in all of those instances, it was in their hand. Yeah. The bread was already in that little boy's hand. He didn't go and buy it. The oil was already in that woman's hand. She didn't have to go borrow it from a neighbor. The slingshot was already in David's hand. He didn't wait to get trained. The rod was already in Moses' hand. Watch this. He didn't have to go get it off Amazon. He already had it. None of this makes sense until we get to uh, the other side of crucifixion. And we're introduced to a man by the name of Thomas. And Thomas is not there for the Easter sunrise service. And he walks up on Jesus who's walking down the road and said, there's no way I'm going to believe that you are the son of God. Said, the only way that I can believe it is show me your hand. God, I can tell y'all ain't spades players right through here. If you show me your hands, then I know that you are the son of God. I need somebody to get this. Isn't it amazing that when it is that you are carrying a weapon, and the police are unsure of what you are carrying. The only thing they ask you is show me your hand. God, I can't hear nobody in here. You get to a place in your life. I'm not talking to the intercessors. I'm talking to the worshipers. That when your back is up against the wall, when you got to deal with snakes and vipers, when you are under satanic attack, God said, you want to get out of this? Show me your hand. You want to know why I worship him? Why, why I lift him up? Why I give him glory? I show him my hand. I dare you to lift up that hand right where you are. Come on, I, I, I dare you to lift him up. We always win. Hallelujah. I said we always win. We always win. That hand is lifted. That hand is lifted. Have you ever considered? Have you ever considered that your victory may be tied to what you can throw down? Your victory is connected to what you can disconnect from. Your victory, the recipe, the ingredients to your victory. I need that hand lifted. The ingredients to your victory is only in one of four places. It's either in your house. It's either in your past experiences. It's either from your former job. Or it is out of your sin. But God said, it's in your hands. And I'm going to use it. I just want to know, like according to the book of Nehemiah, do you have a mind to build? You have a mind to work. Isn't it amazing? Y'all not going to like it. That hand is lifted. Listen to me, please. Isn't it amazing that that little boy with the five loaves of bread never prayed over the bread? Y'all don't like it. Yes. That David never prayed over the sling. That Moses never prayed over the rod. Y'all never paid attention to it? That the woman never prayed over the oil. It was already blessed. They just needed to know how to work it. They just need to know how to use it. I want you to know, you got to work what you're working with. If you learn how to work what you're working with, I better say it's already anointed. It's already ready for the job. It's already consecrated. All you got to do is work it like you know how to work it. You use it like you know how to use it. I'm praying for you. In this moment, allow your pastor to pray for you. But I wanted to uh, expose uh, an undiscussed arsenal of the enemy 
is self-doubt about what you possess. If the enemy can make you second-guess your worth, second-guess your experience, shame you out of your past, or deny your deliverance, you have already lost. If you only knew what God had in mind for you, that before the foundations of the world, he was equipping, here's your shout, inanimate stuff. That's the best thing I done said tonight. He is using random stuff for you to be blessed with. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray over every lifted hand that between now and Sunday, you'll expose what they possess which is a key for their next step. I pray, dear Lord, that somehow or another, randomly, casually, they'll bump into a skill set that they have let ride dormant. That there's a gifting that they have that they have buried. But God, I need you to unearth it. I pray, dear Lord, that you'll provoke them to use what they have taken for granted. I pray that you'll jar their memory. That there is a talent they have. There is a gift that they use. And I pray, dear Lord, between now and Sunday, you give them an opportunity to use it. And I pray, dear Lord, you'll let somebody see it being used. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give God glory for what's in your hand? Come on, I said give him glory. Come on, put that hand together like you got what it takes. Come on, you got what it takes. I want, uh, real quick, while you're standing, uh, media ministry, put that author ash quote back up for me real quick. Hallelujah. Real quick. Thank you. Amen. Every person, come on, let's declare it again with authority. Start where you are. Use what you have and do what you can. Come on, say it with authority. Start where you are. Now listen, you're going to have to now make it personal. Don't repeat after me. I'm telling you how you're going to do it. I'm going to start where I am. I'm going to use what I have. And I'm going to do what I can. Come on, let's make it personal, everybody. I'm going to start where I am. I'm going to use what I have. And I'm going to do what I can. Come on, say it one last time. I'm going to start where I am. I'm going to use what I have. And I'm going to do what I can. If you're going to make that covenant commitment tonight, give God glory for it. We already have what it takes to be a great church. What we need to be a great church is, here it is, it's in the house. In order for us to be a great church, here it is, we got to use people who have a past. In order for us to be a great church, are y'all still in here? In order for us to be a great church, we got to provoke children to believe in the power of God and to have a prayer life that is active and is viable. I'm waiting on you. In order for us to be a great church, come on, we got to use our past greatness for our future assignment. To say, God, if you did it before, I know you can do it again. You all made it personal. Let's make it corporate. I need you to give God an electric, explosive praise for where God is taking this church. Come on. Come on. Use what you got. Start where you are. Come on. Use what you got. Start where you are. Use what you got. Start where you are. Do what you can. I want us some. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh my God. That feel good right there. I'm going to start right where I am. I'm going to use what I have. God, I feel that thing right there. I, uh, I, uh, I don't know whether you're standing out in the hallway. I don't know if you're in the periphery of this room. I don't know if you're watching online. Um, but the good news of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is you can start where you are. 
It is never too late for another opportunity. How this altar is open uh, tonight because by chance, per chance, uh, there's somebody here who uh, needs a relationship with God. All the, all the more there's somebody in this room who had no idea you already got what it takes. Can I say it another way? You have what God needs. Yeah. You already have what God needs. You've been slowing down this whole train with your selfish self because you disqualified yourself. You talked yourself out of being a participant in a miracle because you didn't think that you were worthy. God doesn't use perfect people. He uses broken people to fix the world. And we're blessed to be one of them. That woman, that woman was complaining and bitter, anxious and nervous, and God used her. And I need you to see what happened. He didn't say multiply the oil and give it to the community. He says, I need you to perform this miracle just for your house. So your children are not slaves to jobs that they don't need. I need you to do this so that you have more than enough to take care of your daughter so she won't need some man to do it. But she'll know there's enough oil in the house where God is able to do exceedingly. You talked yourself out of it not knowing God needed you. You did everything short of murder. And you think you got away with it. And now you find out tonight that's why God ain't been talking. Because he's been waking, waiting for you to take your shoes off. For you to be vulnerable right in front of him. I don't know where you are. You have never fit in with church people. I said, that's why I got you the new birth. I need you to be in a place where you ain't got to put church clothes on. But that you can know just as I am, God will still accept me. Wherever it is that you are, I don't know who invited you. I don't know whether you're a serial visitor. I don't know whether you're a repeat offender. I don't know where it is that you are. But I'm believing by faith there's somebody who's saying, I got to join this church tonight. I got to get right with God. Because I'm believing by the time I get home, God's going to show me something in my house I can use. Something in my uh, possession that is uh, deserving of ushering in a miracle. If that's where you are, who you are, Brace yourself because in just 30 seconds, somebody's going to help you. I need you, uh, I need you all to help me open the doors of the church, please. Uh, this is my your third consecutive day preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I need your help. I ain't got much left. I'm driving on empty, and I, I, need, I need you to help me. Uh, would you help me open the doors of the church? I told you Sunday, I need your help. I told you I can't do this by myself. I told you it's too big for just me. I needed your help, and you said you would help me. So I, I need you to do it tonight. How uh, would you move around in the studio, in this sanctuary? Move around from where you are and just find somebody who you don't know, who you don't recognize. Ask them, are they saved? Ask them, do they have a church home? Ask them, have they given their life over to God? There's somebody here tonight. There's somebody here tonight. I need you to come. I desperately need for you to come. Hallelujah. Those of you who are online, I want you to go to grownewbirth.org. You don't have a church home. I want you to go online. Get connected to what God is doing. Hallelujah. New birth, would you give God glory for a praise house tonight? You may be seated. I, uh, I was upstairs uh, early today. I was, uh, amen. Here come two. Come on. Come on, y'all ain't doing good. God bless you. Oh, y'all done made my day. Come on, pretty. Thank you. Come on, New Birth, make some noise on a Tuesday night. Y'all know what to do. Stretch your right hand to faith. Repeat after me. You're in the right place at the right time. Joining the right church. Serving the only God. Hold on. Here come two more.
Come on, come on. I got a Sunday morning feeling on a Tuesday night. Thank y'all. You done made my day. You the only man to join today. Come on, let's start it over. Shut your right hand to faith. Repeat after me. You're in the right place. At the right time. Joining the right church. Serving the only God. And I know that's right. Bless the Lord. Are they fine? Come on. If you'll follow right down that center aisle. If you'll follow it that way. Come on, new birth. Give God glory. You may be seated. I was uh, upstairs uh, early today talking to Adam and Chris. And uh, I said to them that so many of us waste millionaire opportunities. We miss critical junctures that are right in front of us. Uh, I read something that I uh, shared with them upstairs uh, that uh, if you spent $28.10 a day, $28.10 a day, it is on Starbucks, on the vending machine at your office, going to get a Snickers around 3 o'clock, picking up some waffle fries from Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. I know you're hungry. Me too. It's all right. If you spent $28.10 a day, watch this, $28.10 a day, at the end of the year, you would have spent $10,000. Just on $28.10 a day. I'm, I want you to think about just what you bought this weekend. You, you should be in a diabetic seizure right now. <laughs> Can you imagine $10,000 discretionary income you just throw out? $28.10 a day. Uh, I would dare say I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want you to raise your hand. I do not want you to raise your hand. This is a studio. This is the chapel. We're still in church. I don't want you lying in church. Yes, yeah, so do not raise your hand. Do you know that the overwhelming majority of us in this room, overwhelming majority of those watching online, do not have 10000 in the bank? Don't have 10000 in investments. You got to make up in your mind. I serve a God, here it is, that can do exceedingly. They can do abundantly. And I'm going to get you on that track. I wonder what it would look like as a church if you was given $28 seeds every day. Did you see how your whole throat just choked up right there? You didn't even have that same sensation when I was talking about Starbucks. Uh, when, I, when I said, sowing into the house of God, $28 uh, dollars a day, that you would have given $10,000 to your church in one year. Here it is when not even 1% of the church does it. Not 1% of the church does it. But I'm telling you that you're going to be able to do it because God's going to put you in that position to do it. I'm, I'm going to stretch your faith because sometimes we got to remember the Japanese proverb, the journey of a million miles starts with one step. It starts with one step. I want every person, I want you to join me tonight in giving a seed of $28.10. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. All of those giving options are on the screen, on Zelle, text, uh, give, uh, give Lafay, push Pushpay. Uh, you mail the check in. Amen. I wonder what would happen if you did that every day till Pentecost. I wonder how that would happen. Here it is, that you weren't waiting on your pay cycle. Did y'all watch the news yesterday and seeing all the people in Atlanta at the IRS office? <laughs> <laughs> the IRS office sent out letters to people in Atlanta you got to come show your ID to get your tax return. It was a line for three blocks. It was a line for three blocks. Why? Because people don't mind waiting for what they're going to receive. But there was no line for people to pay their taxes. Y'all just blacked out. Amen. Not grudgingly, not sparingly, not out of necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver. I want to see something happen. I want my CFO to call me next week and say, Pastor, I don't know what's happening. But random people on Thursday giving $28.10. I don't know what's happening on Saturday. People's giving $28.10 uh, because they've got that kind of faith that if I can invest in lattes and in uh, coffee and in tea and in Krispy Kreme donuts and in Doritos, come on, uh, Snickers, I'm coming for you. Amen. Then the least I can do is invest into of the house of God. $28.10 is the lowest seat I've asked you to do. I was flying uh, this morning, getting back 
uh, from Baltimore, and so we didn't have our collective corporate prayer together this morning. Uh, we're going to pray together uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., uh, so ask that you'll be uh, on our uh, New Birth platforms so that we can pray together on the electronic altar. Uh, amen. How many of you are going to join me in giving 2810 tonight? You're going to join me in giving 28? That ain't enough of y'all. I, I need 100% participation. I need everybody in it. Thank you. 2810, that's what I'm asking uh, every person uh, to do. I know it seemed like a lot uh, unless you're buying something for yourself. It, then it don't seem that expensive. Amen. Uh, every person, would you lift up that phone, lift up your check? Amen. You got a 20, a five, three ones, and a dime. Amen. Hold it up. Thank you. 2810. Thank you so very much. Amen. God, I pray for every person with lifted hands in this room and online. I want to pray what I've never prayed to you before. I pray that every person with lifted hands, no matter what their background, no matter what their income, no matter what their economy, no matter what their credit score, God, I pray that next year this time they'll be able to put their hand on $10,000. I pray that $10,000 cash is at their disposal without having to move anything around. I trust you for it. I believe you for it. I know that you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord. Uh, uh, you're going to, uh, out, if you are not giving by your phone, our dutiful, responsible, and honorable, and integral ushers uh, at the door. And uh, y'all see how I pumped them up? Uh, they, they are great guys. Uh, they are at the door. They're going to be able to uh, receive your seed on tonight. Lord, it's almost 9 o'clock. Y'all stand up. Hurry up. Come on. It's a fire drill. Come on. Amen. This Sunday is Show Me a Sign. Uh, we're believing for a quarter of a million dollars. I need you to go get all of them coin jars out of your house. Amen. All of them loose quarters out of your uh, <laughs> ashtray. Get all of it. Uh, I want all of us in lockstep. Uh, do not forget, those of you who live in DeKalb County, would you raise your hand if you live in DeKalb County? This coming Thursday, we are so blessed that we are hosting uh, the debate uh, for those who are running for CEO of DeKalb County, it's going to be right in this room. Look at how blessed your church is. Uh, Channel 2 is going to be broadcasting live on television at 7 o'clock. I need you in your seats by 645 uh, because we will be broadcasting live. It will be on Channel 2 site as well as it will be on AJC's uh, website. But ask that you will come. I need you to be a mindful and informed and an conscientious voter. Uh, so make sure that you're present. Uh, the last weekend of this month, uh, we started this when I got here, uh, and I'm so excited about it. Uh, the last weekend of this month, uh, Goodwill is bringing trucks up to our church. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday, the 27th and 28th. Uh, and so you got some stuff you got to clean out. It's some stuff you ain't never going to fit again. Some stuff you ain't never going to wear again. Amen. But I, I want you to bring it. Uh, and Pastor Stokes has enlarged it, not just clothes, but household goods uh, that you want to bring. Uh, so you've got uh, lamps you don't use. Uh, you've got end tables you don't use. The truck will be here Saturday and Sunday, the last weekend of the month. Uh, we are the largest donating church in the state of Georgia uh, to the goodwill. I, I have uh, already purged uh, mine. I've begun the purging process. I want you to do it. I want to let you know uh, a little secret. A little secret is uh, when you make room, I'm telling you, I ain't never seen God fail on it. When you make room, uh, God is going to do something. You ain't even going to miss what you give away. I promise you, you ain't even going to miss what you give away. And so uh, I need you to start doing some spring cleaning so you can be a part of this amazing move of God. Would you lift up that hand, please? Lift up that hand right where it is that you are. Lift up that hand. Repeat after me. Uh, walk with God. And he'll walk with me. Talk with God. And they'll talk with me. Listen to God. And they'll listen to me. Build for God. And he'll build for me. Love God. Because he first loved me. Y'all some lazy worshipers. Lift up both hands. Both. What kind of stick up is that with one hand? Y'all have thine own way. Come on, lift up both of them. Now I want to hear him who's absolutely...